on more hepatic encephalopathy, patients on large volume paracentesis uh, require more, so, more hospital admissions and had less severe hepatic encephalopathy, and there was no difference in mortality, quality of life, uh, GI bleed, infection, or renal failure. So pretty difficult uh, choice between TIPS and large volume paracentesis. Um, this study is not being published yet. It's um, a manuscript, and you can find much higher in the large volume paracentesis group. Episodes of hepatic encephalopathy, we said they were similar, 1.6 versus 1.7. Uh, portal hypertension-related bleeding was much higher on the large volume paracentesis group, and hernia, umbilical hernia-related complications were also much higher. So I think we can conclude that maybe cover tips, which don't give tips dysfunction, are a reasonable treatment and better than, um, than uh, large volume paracentesis. And I thought this could apply for well-selected cases under 70, with underlying cirrhosis probably secondary to alcohol, no cardiac problems, MELDESCOR under 15, and no history of a study done by a Canadian group. Please take into account that there is no comparison group. This just, they have a prospective database, but the study is done retrospectively. They include 33 patients, um, and they basically were pretty bad. Like, they require more than two. This is 17 adverse events, uh, mainly infections, as I have remarked here. So um, the median time to adverse event, though, was pretty long, and I thought this is something reasonable for patients. For example, I don't know, I have a patient in the Coromandel, I tell them, oh, come twice a month for a paracentesis. Maybe we should be discussing about this, knowing, of course, that the patient has a high risk of complications related to uh, infection. So another good thing about Hamilton, <laughs> location, location, location. <laughs> So uh, basically, we can be surfing in Raglan in the evening after work, can go to the Coromandel for the weekend, or I can even catch a flight to go to Barcelona and be there in like only five days. <laughs> <laughs> so really good. Going back to uh, our topic, hepatorenal syndrome. Um, as I said, I'm mainly kind of going to discuss with you things that I think will be practical uh, to um, uh, do in your clinical practice. Um, and unfortunately, I'm going to go through a few concepts to do that. First of all, I'm going to discuss with you the definition of hepatorenal syndrome. Um, so the definition of hepatorenal syndrome had changed quite a lot through the years. Uh, rules had been kind of less strict. And um, the, the latest guidelines were published in 2015 and were driven by other definitions of acute kidney injury in the rest of the population. And basically, let me tell you about this flow chart because I think it's extremely helpful to deal with patients in clinical practice. So uh, the definition of a stage one acute kidney injury is an increase on the creatinine by 26.5 millimoles per liter. So this is now a dynamic definition. Um, and if our patient is in that situation, what we should be doing next is withdrawing nephrotoxic drugs, vasodilators, non-steroidals, consider withdrawing diuretics, thinking, does our patient have an infection I need to treat? Give volume expansion in a um, particular context, for example, if the patient has come with an upper GI bleed, and of course, close monitoring. Um, what about if the patient comes um, with a higher increase on the creatinine? So if it's at least twice normal value, we should be thinking of all of this we just mentioned, but also on giving albumin straight away for two days. Again, close monitoring, and if we haven't withdrawn diuretics, do that then. Um, if the patient doesn't respond to this strategy, we jump into this one, and from here, if the patient has not response, we need to be thinking of hepatorenal syndrome. And this is, so I'm gonna jump now into the treatment of hepatorenal syndrome, and as we said, First of all, probably the most important thing is prevention, as we always think as doctors. Um, so we know that um, hepatorenal is the kind of the three uh, vasoconstrictors we've been using so far. Uh, this is a summary of uh, all the studies done in hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, they are all pretty small. Uh, these are uh, randomized controlled trials. These are prospective, and these are retrospective and in most of them we use terlipressin. 
Um, when patients respond to terlipressin, we know that they do better. The prognosis is better than when patients don't respond, and that is universal. That happens in all the studies. But unfortunately, mortality is still pretty high in general, and um, it's the most severe complication that patients have with cirrhosis, really. This is kind of the general scheme how we treat patients with hepatorenal syndrome. So um, we diagnose them of acute kidney injury, give them albumin, see what happens, nothing happens, okay, hepatorenal syndrome. And we continue with the albumin one, two bottles a day and early pressing 0.5 milligrams every four hours. If the patient doesn't get better, we increase to one milligram after three days. And after six days, we increase two milligrams every four hours and we uh, continue treatment for up to 15 days. Um, I wanted to discuss this study with you, which is being published, I think it was in September, um, in which they compared terlipressin and albumin versus albumin. And the reason why I wanted to discuss this study is because the, it's the biggest study ever done in hepatorenal syndrome. Um, they assessed 2,000 patients and they randomized 196 and I think this reflects the difficulty of this study. So when you read hepatorenal syndrome, we'll do a big randomized trial. It's probably not going to be true, because this is as big as it gets in this condition. And these are the results, which I think they are quite poor. So terli pressing 24% response to treatment, reversal of the renal failure versus 15 in the placebo group and no difference in mortality. This is not statistically significant. The reasons behind it are probably different practice. Um, so uh, this study reflects a response to terlipressin that it's much lower than previous studies where a response was 24% versus 40 to 55% in previous studies. And the reasons behind that are probably, this graph represents when patients uh, withdraw treatment and when to have renal replacement. Uh, it probably reflects that there was a very early withdrawal, and we know that early person takes a few days to work, and there was a very high transplant rate in this study. So I think it doesn't really kind of tell us that we should be, be treating patients with early pressing anymore. It just tells us that, that the study was negative, I think. Um, because as I said, the rest of the studies had been showing something a bit better. Uh, this um, study, I thought it was very interesting, and just when I was preparing my topic, I had a patient in the world with acute kidney injury, which I tried this magic uh, cocktail, and it worked really well. So I'm going to discuss it with you. The Italian group um, want to, um, wanted to try whether terlipressin infusion was better than IV boluses, and it's based on this rationale. Terlipressin uh, maximum uh, vasoconstrictor effect occurs one hour after uh, the injection, and then it, wear off, it wears off. And after four hours, it's probably very similar to placebo. So what they did, they did a randomized control trial, including 37 patients in the uh, bolus group, 34 patients in the infusion group, and these are response to therapy, which I can read from here, but they're about 69% in the bolus group, versus 57% in the uh, infusion group, and this was similar. What it is different is the uh, maximum dose of terlipressin, which is much lower in the infusion group. These are the responders, and they require around 2.5 milligrams of terlipressin maximum, and these are the responders on the uh, bolus group, which it requires 4.5. And this translates into less events, um, less uh, severe adversive, uh, adverse events. So we can see here that the infusion group had seven adverse events versus 16, and this was a statistically significant. So um, I just studied a patient the other day on two milligrams every 24 hours, which sounds a really low dose, and her blood pressure came up amazingly, and she responded to treatment, and her renal impairment reversed, so it does work. Um, what about other strategies? Uh, what about terlipressin albumin versus midodrine and octrotide plus albumin? So midodrine and octrotide are promising uh, medications, as 
Uh, Midodrine is an alpha-1 um, adrenergic agonist, and octotide is a splagnic vasoconstrictor, so they sound like the right cocktail for this condition. But uh, unfortunately, the results are much poorer. Did you um, discuss noradrenaline, which I think is a very interesting vasoconstrictor. This is a, a study a bit old, published in 2012, in which um, the, an Indian group um, ran, did a randomized control, like the second best option. And I don't think midodrine and octreotide with albumin are as good, but should be considered if we live in the States and it's the only thing we can give to our patients. So um, my last um, thing was uh, another thing I love about uh, Hamilton. Uh, even though I have a good uh, work-life uh, balance, I do spend quite a lot of time at work. Uh, so uh, I do love the hospital. I work with an amazing team. The Yeah, I think uh, you're right. I th there is a very small study published in 2010 in GAD by the uh, UK uh, group, which is a very small study, and I think it's the only one that maybe we should get together and do something else, in which they give albumin to reverse uh, hyponatremia, and they have a positive impact. So I guess here, if you improve the, improve the hemodynamics of the patients, I think you should improve the hyponatremia. It's just it's difficult to tell exactly if it's the combination of both or... Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's a very interesting comment. And, and you're right, I just skip on purpose hyponatremia because it's such a controversial topic, and there is really, I think, nothing clear to give to our patients except treating the other bits, treating the ascites or treating the, the hepatorenal syndrome. But I think you're right. There was a very small study um, to treat patients with terribly pressing to. Um, see if that helped managing ascites, and that was a negative study. I was kind of half involved when I did some, some research in ascites. Yeah. Why would cardiac arrhythmia be associated with hyponatremia? Is that just a cover I have no idea. I just think um, the, the only difference with the cover stance is that there is less dysfunction. So when you add dysfunction, you add kind of difficult managing that patient, right? So, so I think that's the, what the cover stance does. It does get rid of the tips dysfunction. So uh, I have no idea. I think it does um, help, for example, there is no advantage in upper GI bleed with a pre-cover stance era, uh, which sounds again weird. You know, you give a tips to your patient and they bleed the same as the people treated with large volume paracentesis. And I think it's just probably, um, the fact that uh, they do well with the, with the cover stents. You improve the hemodynamics. The renin angiotensin aldosterone levels were much lower on the TIPS group. So maybe they just do better because they are uh, better controlled. Uh, in my, I have two life experiences. This is my third one. In my first life, I live in Barcelona, and I saw really bad results with TIPS. In my second life, I live in uh, Scotland where Absolutely all my patients had a history of alcohol excess, and they did really well with tips. And I wonder if that also has something to uh, play a role with in the, fact, in the sense that they all stopped drinking, so they might have a positive impact that way. You improve the hemodynamics, and that might just in, um, counter for the decreased um, incidence of hepat hepatic encephalopathy. They just have a bit of a reversal of that liver failure, I think.
Um, I think you should probably only perform TIPS if you are used to managing these patients, uh, and you should have a confident either hepatologist or radiologist, depending who puts the TIPS in your center. Um, I mean, all the studies are very small, even for big centers. You know, um, I think you have to select your patients, otherwise they don't do well, uh, and you have to have a confident radiologist. I think that's the kind of the um, two things you need. Um, I'm not sure there is much evidence that, you know, if you just put 10 tips a year, you're going to do worse than if you put 100, because it's still, I would say, um, a small volume procedure. I don't know if the Oakland team has anything to comment, if they feel that all the tips have to be done. I don't. I don't in the Yes. Totally. Oh, thanks, Tony. I, I don't think my the, the forward button. Can you actually move my slides? Because I don't think this is working. Oh, okay. Maybe that's. Uh, oh, that's yes, I was instructed to use this one. Mm. Okay. Let's try. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to talk on, on endoscopic therapy for uh, varices, and I'm going to cover esophageal varices, management of gastric varices, and just a sh short point of the ectopic varices, which uh, we really see, and they're probably managed uh, somewhere in between. Um, so the first of all, I just want to talk about grading, and this does not show. So this is actually corrupted. The, can I just see the slide? Uh, when the hepatoportal venous gradient is more than 10 millimeters of mercury, and there's a progression of development of about 8% per year. And again, once the circulation becomes more hyperdynamic, there can be progression from small to large varices, and again, at about an 8% per year um, gradient. Once the pressure within the varix is higher than the variceal wall tension, you then get bleeding. And in esophageal varices, the hemorrhage rate is about 5 to 15 percent per year, while in gastric varices, it's about one quarter every two years. And of course, you can have recurrent hem hemorrhage if that's not managed. Endoscopically, we use different grading systems, and the, I found these classifications overlap. 
So the grade one varices are those that are barely visible, but you can flatten them with insufflation, while grade two varices occupy less than 50% of the lumen. They can no longer be uh, flattened on a three yearly basis. While if they have small varices, you look at those other endoscopic features, though, if they have um, a risk of hemorrhage or child pu B and C, for those uh, would have some advantage with beta blockers. While medium to large varices with high risk features should probably have beta blockers with or without banding at that point in time. While those patients who um, have no high risk features, um, beta blockers are probably useful, or if they can't tolerate them, consider banding prophylactically if they haven't bleed. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about primary prophylaxis and what to do exactly, and secondary prophylaxis and then rescue therapy. In terms of primary prophylaxis, what you're trying to achieve is reduce portal flow, increase the portal resistance, and, and reduce the portal pressures, basically. And we know that um, splanctic vasoconstrictors are probably best at this, and um, the other mechanism is venodilation, and the nitrates on their own um, probably are poorly tolerated and probably don't work on their own. While if you use them in combination, they're synergistic, but because of the long-term renal impairment and mortality, probably are not recommended. So that leaves us with splanctic vasoconstrictors, which are basically non-selective uh, beta blockers, which is, in, in effect, what somatostatin and vasopressin does acutely. Um, the three drugs that are suggested are propranolol, nadolol, and cavidolol. They are cost-effective, but 30% of patients don't respond. And they do have some side effects, and that limits compliance in our patients. What it doesn't do, it doesn't necessarily prevent progression to the larger varices. So you still, when they are on beta blockers, you have to repeat the endoscopy and make sure that those patients don't progress to more high-risk features. Um, and you should, in patients who are on um, selective uh, beta blockers, should be trying you try and uh, progress them to non-selective beta blockers if you can. When the patient has bled, basically initially, uh, you need to ask the emergency staff to appropriately resuscitate these patients with volume support. Uh, remember antibiotic prophylaxis, as, as Dara has uh, alluded to and start pharmacotherapy with tulipressin. So that's the initial uh, emergency uh, assessment and treatment of those patients. We should then have an emergent uh, gastroscopy and confirm that you have, are dealing with uh, esophageal varices and then treat them appropriately with, with a variceal banding, which is the first-line treatment, and then consider uh, rescue therapy if the bleeding is uncontrolled, such as TIPS, and I'll mention a little bit more on that. So banding is basically straightforward. Uh, most of you have seen band ligators. It's effective in achieving hemostasis in 90% of patients. There's a low bleeding re re rate and basically low adverse uh, event profile. The other option is sclerotherapy. And um, there is limited really. It does affect, it does uh, achieve hemostasis, but does have quite a high rate of delayed bleeding. And these are the agents we've used historically, and most of us have got one or other in our fridge still, but um, they shouldn't be forgotten uh, as rescue therapy, but it's probably not uh, advised as a primary therapy. So patients who have had a bleed uh, should definitely be on a non-selective beta blocker plus banding at that point in time. Um, we need to adjust the beta blocker dose so that patients will continue uh, the ma maximal effect, but. Um, not have overt uh, side effects, and again, banding should be repeated until you achieve obliteration because that eventually will actually achieve the best outcome. And those patients who um, are TIPS is available. It is limited by expertise and timing because the radiologists are on call, they're not always available, um, and so there are certain centres that will offer it and others don't. And you really have to transport a stable patient to get ready, so you still have to temporise another way, such as the, uh, the balloon tamponade, to get your patient to a place where the tips can be done. Um, there have been some issues with delayed stent occlusion, which is now overcome with some of the um, covered stents. I'll just point to two, uh, two novel um, interventions. So this is a, the Ella, um, Essex Ella stent, um, which now comes pre-mounted on this catheter. It's, you can't put it through the scope. You have to put it over a guide wire. It has radiological markers. Um, it was quite a small study, 
which was a fully covered and removable stent. They achieved hemostasis in 90%, and in fact, this was a randomized trial looking at lower complication rate versus balloon tamponade, mainly patients aspirated lease. Um, and that led to the Bivino 6 consensus recommendation, which now puts this in the recommendation as an option. Not a lot of data, but an option if you don't have tips available, for example. This stent can be, you can have it in your, in your uh, it's quite difficult to deploy um, and it's quite large, but it is possible just as an option. The other interesting thing I, was, uh, I did, uh, found during literature search was the use of hemospray. It obviously does need active oozing or bleeding to work. It's easy to apply and most of you have it available. And there was a study of 30 patients by this uh, group, which is published twice, once in GIE and in the GIE uh, um, European Journal. 30 patients, most of them were esophageal variceal bleeders, but there were some patients with gastric varices. Um, only half of them had active bleeding, so you would have, might question why they used it. But they achieved hemostasis, and only one of them rebled. And obviously, uh, this can be used as a, again as a temporizing um, measure. So if you're in Rotorua or somewhere else where you don't have access to the stenting or tips or balloon tamponade, this may be an option for you to temporize to get the patient treated elsewhere. I'm going to switch over to gastric varices, and this is probably something most of you don't want to see, active bleeding with a big, large fundal varices. Uh, that will be sort of... Um, things that would scare most of us. Uh, so gastric varices are present in about 5 to 30 percent in patients with portal hypertension. When you translate that, about 30 percent of cirrhotics get variceal bleeding, and about 10 to 20 percent of those are gastric bleeders compared to the esophageal varices. The incidence of bleeding when you do have gastric varices, easy to remember, about a quarter at two years, about a third at three, and about half at five years. So the bleeding risk does go up, and obviously uh, the bleeding is often more severe uh, and more torrential. But the risk factors are, again, related to size, child pew class, and, again, endoscopic um, signs of um, impending bleeding or recent bleeding. So your assessment is much the same as with uh, esophageal varices. The classification of gastric, gastric varices is this uh, sarin classification where the GLV-1 varices extend on the lesser curve and are treated much as esophageal varices with banding, while those patients who have got uh, GLV-2 extending onto the cardia or isolated gastric varices should be treated in a different way, which we'll discuss now. Basically, um, again, patients should be stabilised and then um, uh, endoscopic treatment uh, should be uh, organised at that point in time. There are some small studies, so there's insufficient data on the guidelines to tell us exactly um, what you should do in, in both of the, um, these situations. But the small studies tend to suggest that glue is better than beta blockers versus no treatment in these small studies showing an improved survival at two years and a, obviously um, a lower re-bleeding rate. Um, with secondary prophylaxis, again, glue appears to be better than beta blockers. Um, when you look at the other options that we've traditionally used, like sclerosins, banding, and thrombin, they do have a reasonably good uh, hemostasis rate, but they're limited by their re-bleeding rate. So the, you might get initial hemostasis, but most of those patients will re-bleed, so you've not effectively treated the varics uh, for, for longer term. While with, say, an acrylate, the hemostasis rate is quite good, and the re-bleeding re rate is looking reasonable, and we'll show you some more data on that. When you look at comparative, uh, uh, so cyanoacrylate versus sclerosant or banding, again, it reconfirms that the hemostasis rate is, is better with cyanoacrylate versus um, sclerosant or banding, and again, the re-bleeding rate is very high in those patients not treated with glue. So glue is the preferred endoscopic treatment when you have it available, and the guidelines uh, recommend that, both the ASL guidelines and the Bivino uh, 2015 update. So glue was first used in 1986 by Nipsa Hendra in Hamburg um, and shown to be very effective and reasonably easy to use. So this is basically super glue and you can see the glue exposed to air and or blood. 
will rapidly polymerize um, when injected and in contact with blood. And this will form um, a blue plug that will then occlude that uh, offending varix. There are two forms. Uh, traditionally, we've used, all used histoacryl. It polymerizes really quickly. You have to dilute it, and you have to inject it really quickly, otherwise it will solidify on the end of your needle, and you have to in inject small amounts. The difference between the dermabond and this is you, can, you have to use distilled water. I, we now use dermabond because it's easier to use. Uh, it's easily available, but it polymerizes more slowly. Um, it doesn't require lipidol um, dilution, but you have to inject it a little bit more slowly, so that otherwise you get too much embolization. And you might need to use slightly bigger volumes with that. And here you can use saline. So the setup for, for bluing is basically you have to coat your tip and the channel with silicone oil so you don't have the uh, super glue in your channel and on the outside of your scope. Uh, you have to prime the, the catheter with water or saline, depending on which agents you use. You puncture the varix um, and inject, and if there's free flow without bleep formation, then it confirms that you're within the varix, although you can't confirm that. With cyanoacrylate, again, ra more rapid injection. With um, octal, which is dermabond, uh, you have to go more slowly. You then have to flush your dead space continuously to keep that needle open if you want to put more glue in. Um, and you need to assess if your varix is obliterated because that should be your end point. So this is a freehand injection, um, basically injecting glue. And you can see as you pull out, you should just flush your channel to keep that needle patent because otherwise you have uh, polymerized glue in your injecting needle and you won't be able to inject any more. And you can then uh, perform a, a second injection, say with another mill, and you can try in between palpate with a soft tip to show that you've actually got obliteration, and that's three months after when the glue extrudes. The difficulty with glue is that it has dreaded complications with embolization, and there has certainly have been fatal cases, and that's sort of limited the uptake of it, and people have been scared to use glue. However, if we look at this larger study of 750 patients with, with using glue, the remedial rate is very low now, it does have some chances of septic complications uh, and some local complication of ulceration and hemoperitoneum. So the complication rate is about 7%. But these patients are quite ill and uh, are at risk of dying if you don't treat them otherwise. This is uh, sort of the extreme. When it bleeds so torrentially, you see nothing. So what do you do now? So this is where EUS comes in. So with ultrasound, you can obviously see the vessels and you can directly inject into the vessels rather than blindly injecting. And you can also confirm that you've obliterated your varix afterwards. So it has sort of advantages. So this is a patient with large varices. And you can see that you can confirm and see the varices, confirm the Doppler flow. And here with the glue injection, you see what we all fear is that all of these patients have embolization of glue. So you see the glue flicking off as you're injecting it. But the idea is to continue injecting and fill that whole varix completely until you get a complete white, white out and then you have um, obliteration. And this is six months afterwards. The glue extrudes and you can't see any more varices. They're completely occluded. Um, so the, the technique of uh, EUS guided puncture um, has also been modified to use uh, coils, and this is a vascular coil. It's got a little uh, vascular coil that you've used for neurologists. It's got little, little uh, hairs on the end. And when you inject glue onto it and expose it to, to um, blood, you can see that the glue actually sticks to the coil. So the idea of using the coil alone or with, with glue is that you reduce the embolization and the risks of embolization, and there have been several studies to look at that. So we, um, the group I was working with, we published, can you run that video? That's the one that doesn't run. Um, published uh, the first 30 patients using a combination of coil and then glue. Uh, we showed that we used less glue compared to freehand glue injection alone. The technical success was good and obliteration of your varices was excellent. And in this group of patients, uh, there was 
uh, no significant complications. And you can see here, th through the 19 gauge needle, you would then deploy the, um, the, uh, glue, uh, the coil first and then inject the glue that sticks directly to the coil. Um, this is an important study because it um, randomized coil versus glue. And it shows that in this, these patients, they, they did with lipidol, so cyanoacrylate with lipidol, and we show that they showed that 58% of those patients actually had complications, most of them asymptomatic PEs. So we know that glue alone probably has a very high risk of embolization, which we showed on that video. While if you use a coil alone, you won't have any embolization because there's no glue involved. This is a study that was the um, same group that of 152 patients that has now been published with a technical success of most of those using coil and then glue, where basically the obliteration rate of the gastric varices was 94%. Um, so 80% were the first treatment. Some patients required second treatment, so you bring them back with surveillance and then you uh, treat the varics as, as needed. Um, a small number had active bleeding, or, uh, but a larger number had a history of bleeding, so these were patients that, that were transferred in. And we had a deliberate cohort of 40 patients that have never bled, and so we deliberately had a, a cohort of patients that we wanted to treat prophylactically. And the outcomes were pretty good, so 8% of patients had re-bleeding, and often the re-bleeding occurs when the coil or the glue extrudes, and you have a small GI bleed. Often those are not significant. So if we look at the significant re-bleed rate, it's only around 4%. And this is a follow-up of uh, 16 months, so uh, quite a long follow-up. And a lot of the patients, if they do re-bleed, can have repeat glue or coil. Some patients had tips or splenectomy or IR embolization. Particularly these patients were at other centers. They weren't re-referred back to the, uh, the referring center. In the 40 patients that we treated prophylactically, um, obviously we were concerned that this was a group that there's no guidelines. We wanted to see how they did and all of the patients had obliteration at follow-up um, and a very low uh, complication rate. So I just want you to show, show you how, how, how this is done. So you basically puncture the varics using a 19 gauge needle. You can use a 22 gauge needle but then you're limited to the smaller coils uh, or if you're just going to use glue alone. You insert the coil first and then the glue after the coil. And this is what it looks like. So this is a patient with large gastric varices, endoscopically. Again, confirmation under EUS of the varix with Doppler. We usually, uh, the, uh, the positioning of the EUS scope is actually also great. So it's in the esophagus going across the cruise muscle. That's the best uh, aim because you have a straighter aim rather than a retroflexion. And in this position, you then deliberately puncture the varix with a 19 gauge needle, and then you de deploy the coil um, through the, that needle. And in this patient, so they're, they're preformed, so they just form, it's, it's basically either four to 15 centimeters, they've got these little hairs, and they basically just stay in the lumen. You have to choose the right size, so if you choose too small, they'll, they'll push off. If you choose them too big, then you won't get your coil completely into the varics, so that's an issue too. So you usually use the short diameter. But yeah, difficult to embolize something that's like a little snake. Feasible, but it's a dirty environment, so I don't think that's a good idea. Thank you, Tony. So. Um, Next time Jim Brooker asks me if I'll give a talk, I'll be ready with a preloaded answer because I think encephalopathy at 20 to 5 with wine at the other end of the talk is probably a bit of a big ask. Um, so I ask you to bear with me as we go through these slides. <laughs> Um, now, encephalopathy is um, a subject in liver disease that really has been um, in trouble for many years because it lacks proper ways of defining it and naming it and talking about um, what we're actually talking about to say it's the same thing. And so research really has been very slow. So in contrast to the two previous talks with all these fantastic new innovations, I think it's very unlikely you're going to hear anything too new from me this afternoon. <laughs> 
The pathogenesis as well is, is not uh, well understood, despite the fact that this disease, this, this complication of cirrhosis has been recognized for many, many years. difficult to make an accurate diagnosis, and also really it has limited our treatments um, and research into new types of treatments. So I'm going to go and try uh, to go through some of these things with you uh, just now. Now, I always like a little bit of history, and it's interesting to think that uh, back in the years BC, there was fellas walking around with jaundice and acute behavioural change. Now, having worked in Manchester for many years, that doesn't necessarily mean it's encephalopathy. <laughs> um, uh, but you'd like to think that the guy um, who was the nobleman in Venice drinking whatever he was drinking then and became agitated and somnolent probably did have liver disease because he had ascites and then died. Um, and it was von Ferrix, who we'll hear from later, who actually made a clinical examination of a shrinking liver in a patient who was becoming delirious. So it's been around for many years, and I'm going to be plagued by the point. I know I'm not. Um, but some work in the late 1980s, when surgeons, for reasons better known to themselves, made portosystemic shunts in dogs and then fed them high-protein meals, found that the dogs became ataxic and then agitated and then fell, fell into a coma. Now, who knows? Surgical minds. Um, but it was Sheila Sherlock, the doyen of uh, British um, uh, hepatology, who really started to think of this as more as an encephalopathy, not just coma, and that it was actually related to liver diseases of different types. She was the first person to associate it with hyperemonemia in humans and, in fact, demonstrated an improvement with tetracyclines. Um, and it was a few years later that the term hepatic encephalopathy became more widely used. Now, this is the most recent and, in fact, the only practice guideline in hepatic encephalopathy that I could find. And they really were um, looking towards trying to define and name encephalopathy um, in a more holistic way rather than that which we have been using up until now. Now, uh, this of um, saying that hepatic encephalopathy in encapsulates a broad spectrum of neuropsychiatric disturbance occurring in acute or chronic liver failure or portosystemic shunting, manifesting as a wide spectrum of neurological or psychiatric abnormalities reigning, ranging from subclinical alterations to coma. Well, it's not exactly a tidy definition, is it? And you can imagine that they probably argued for many hours before they came up with that. But it does just speak to the fact that this is a protein manifestation of cirrhosis um, and liver disease. What I want to try and bring out in, as, I'm, as I'm talking through is that all encephalopathy is not made equal, and I think you'll see that in the way that these guidelines have started to define it in this more holistic way. And it's really important to recognize the difference between acute liver failure and chronic liver failure and the way in which patients present with encephalopathy in these situations. In acute liver failure, particularly in the hyperacute variety when patients can go from a perfectly normal liver to one which can't support life in seven days, you can see a very rapid and severe encephalopathy really developing in, in the most frightening ways. And it's in this situation that we commonly see cerebral edema, cerebral hypertension and herniation, which is a major cause of death in these patients. Now, when we look at chronic liver disease, of course, our end-stage chronic liver disease patients can have very severe encephalopathy, but it tends to develop more insidiously. It's not usually as rapid. It's more predictable. And along with portosystemic shunting is usually because of precipitating factors like your patient with a variceal bleed or your patient with um, acute severe sepsis. And it hasn't been included in these guidelines, but I suspect we will see it as an emerging topic over the next few years. It's been a subject of much debate in the hepatology literature as the acute on chronic liver failure, which is patients who have end-stage liver disease. They then have a precipitating event and they, event, and they end up with multiple organ failure and systemic inflammatory response. And this seems to give patients with chronic liver disease a more acute flavor to their encephalopathy. Now, if we look here, this is what most of us are um, more familiar with, with, with terming patients um, as being encephalopathic, and it's how we tend to talk about it, uh, the West Haven grades. So grade naught, with no abnormalities detected, this is by clinicians. Grade one, often, really, if people recognize it at all, it's their loved ones that recognize it, we probably wouldn't recognize it as, as clinicians. Grade four, coma, well, that's usually pretty easy for most of us to recognize. And the differentiation between grade two and grade three, really very subjective. Thinking more of covert encephalopathy, <coughs> i.e. that which we wouldn't detect unless we do specific.
these new guidelines are saying that are important and I, I think it's very good because acute liver failure versus cirrhosis or portosystemic systemic shunting are very different manifestations with encephalopathy. The time course is important. The patient who has one episode of encephalopathy um, and then doesn't have it again, the patient who has recurrent encephalopathy, and of course the patient who has persistent encephalopathy, and whether these episodes occur in the presence or absence of precipitants. And so this is what they've come up with, which I think is quite a helpful aid memoir if it's not exactly to look at. Here, type C cirrhosis and type B portosystemic shunting. Minimal and grade 1 encephalopathy are converted into covert encephalopathy and 2 through 4 are obviously overt. It encourages to think of the time course as well as whether the situation is precipitated or not. And if you think if you're going from the top to the bottom of this table, you're generally seeing people with more severe disease. And if we think of somebody, say, with what we would, somebody would phone up and say, oh, Rachel, I've got this guy with grade 2 encephalopathy, does he need a transplant? Well, it kind of depends. If he's got acute liver failure, I want him with me yesterday. Um, if he's got an, a single episode which was precipitated by um, taking some temazepam, then I would think of that as far less serious than if he'd got persistent grade 2 encephalopathy, which was just occurring spontaneously. So I think rather than just thinking of our grade 2 or our grade 3, this new nomenclature does encourage us to think about the patients more holistically and I think it's quite similar actually as I'm just looking at Frank it's quite similar the way that we think of bleeding that it's not just the size of the varices it's the patient within which it, it occurs. Um, so encephalopathy is common it's um, difficult really to be certain about how often we do see or don't see covert encephalopathy. Um, some studies suggest between 20 and 80 percent but there really is no standardized way in which to make this diagnosis and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But where it is detected, it does seem to be important for the quality of life of both our patients and their caregivers. Overt encephalopathy occurs in over a third of patients. Um, so it is something that we should probably look um, carefully for, if not more carefully than we do already. And once you've had one episode, even with treatment, you're quite likely to get another. Now, when we look at pathogenesis, I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I am no neurobiologist, and it is just a morass of data out there with all these long words that I can barely say. So I've chosen to keep it simple, and once again, I've gone to history um, as we talked about these bizarre surgical shunts with, um, uh, in dogs implicated ammonia way back in the 1890s. But this is also quite weird. I wonder what people will think when they look back on our practice now. But um, back in the 1950s, they were using cationic resins for treating ascites. I have no idea how that worked but they contained ammonium and they found that um, patients got confused when they were giving them the treatment and so then they thought hey ho let's give them ammonia and then they had uh, reversible um, uh, behavioral change as well. Um, in the early 2000s, it became evident that ammonia was high um, in people with cirrhosis, um, but then later that this lacks correlation with the severity of cirrhosis, and I'll come back to that. But then some really important work, you know, really, which is still ongoing up till recently, about the important prognostic nature of ammonia in patients with acute liver failure. Now this is my attempt to explain the pathogenesis which is uh, based largely in problems with ammonia and as I think we all know um, it's the colonic bacteria that act on proteins to cause ammonia production and in health this enters the portal circulation where it's largely deaminized in the urea cycle and then excreted um, from the liver. But if the liver isn't working then the ammonia uh, obviously falls into the systemic circulation um, and when, it's, um, when the neurons find themselves in the presence of this ammonia, there's all sorts of strange things that happen to their neurotransmitters. They don't work properly, and hence the, the, the protein manifestations of cirrhosis, it can affect any nerves in a whole manner of different ways. Now, this is in chronic liver disease. In acute liver failure, one of the differences, as I've said, we do see cerebral edema commonly in patients with acute liver failure, and this is probably something to do with the high levels of ammonia getting across the blood-brain barrier in a, previously, a brain that's previously naive to the effects of ammonia. Um, and in this situation, we see the glutamine synthetase causing an overproduction of lactate and glutamine, which is toxic to the neurons and actually causes neuronal swelling. Um, as, and in conjunction with cerebral hyperemia, that's one thought about where um, 
the intracerebral hyper, um, hypertension may come from. And this is taken from a really nice um, review in the New England Journal of Medicine, which actually goes over a lot of what I'm talking about today. There's other thoughts, um, GABA receptors, uh, benzodiazepines, and so uh, you may have heard that people give shots of flubazenil and people with um, encephalopathy wake up. It's not actually ever been used um, in any way therapeutically because it's too short acting. There's manganese in the patient's brains when we do MRI scans. So what do all of these mean and where do they fit in? Well, it's way beyond my knowledge of neurobiology. I think SERS and sepsis does have a place, and this is probably important in patients with acute liver failure and potentially acute on chronic liver failure as well, because the pro-inflammatory cytokines of SERS and sepsis probably increase the ammoniacal toxicity uh, within the brain, making patients more susceptible to encephalopathy. Oops, days. Oh, heck. Having not worked, it's now got overexcited. Now, um, this is this is this guy von Ferrex again, and he he let me, I found this lovely description of observed phases of gloomy, irritable temper and restlessness, quiet and harmless wandering, and maniacal paroxysms. And I wasn't quite sure what he was referring to, but apparently it's um, it's it's description of encephalopathy from back in the 1860s. But I can certainly think of people that I know that would fit that description. <laughs> Um, now, the diagnosis of overt encephalopathy I don't think will be new to anybody in this room. Um, I think it's just important to remember that the manifestations can be very, very strange. Um, so patients can present with extrapyramidal um, syndromes looking like Parkinson's, people with acute liver failure or, or bad encephalopathy or whatever stage can look like they've had a brainstem stroke. And this thing called hepatic myelopathy, which I'd never heard of and never seen, is, is a more a peripheral neuropathy type picture people even de developing spastic paraparesis, all as a consequence of encephalopathy. Now the classic flap or fetal I think we're all familiar with, apparently some people can smell it, some people can't, I don't know if that's true. And in the unconscious patient or the ventilated patients, the presence of sustained clonus is often a helpful clue as well. Trail making tests and star making tests, if you can hazard a guess at how to interpret them, can sometimes be helpful. People like to use EEGs, but there really is no... Um, standardized characterization of what an EEG should look like um, and encephalopathy because it can be particularly helpful in a ventilated patient to rule out non-convulsive non status. Now covert encephalopathy, as I've already said, this is encephalopathy, encephalopathy that we can't detect. Our patients' families may suspect it, but we can't clinically detect it. And it can really only be formally diagnosed using a whole battery of uh, psychometric tests, and I've listed a few of them here. So in an ideal world, what we would do is do, all, uh, do these psychometric tests on all our patients with cirrhosis, because we think this is, this is um, important for their quality of life. Um, but the problem is, these are guarded jealously by the psychological associations. I know from trying to do a study with a psychologist previously on work with young people post-transplant, that they wouldn't actually allow the tests to be used in a certain scenario. I can't remember the details, but they really do guard them very jealously, and they certainly wouldn't let people other than trained psychologists do these tests. And therefore, it's completely impractical in an arena where I think most of us struggle to get psychological support for our patients that need it clinically. To think we could do it to make um, a subclinical diagnosis, I think, is impractical. Again, the EEG. The EEG is more useful the worse the encephalopathy is. So if you're using it for very mild encephalopathy, it's probably not going to be helpful. And I think really the best we can come up with, although the clinical guidelines say you don't need to treat it, if we have a high index of suspicion, um, and if our patients say, you know, oh, I just feel a bit forgetful sometimes or whatever, that we don't just push it to one side because we're in a busy clinic. We try and think about whether this may be a situation and maybe even think about offering them a trial of treatment. Now, this is one of my own personal little soapboxes, so bear with me, is the difference of the use of ammonia in chronic liver disease and in acute liver failure. This is actually taken as a quote from these easel treatment, easel and arsel treatment guidelines, and they say that you should not be doing ammonia measurements in the assessment of encephalopathy in patients with chronic liver disease because it lacks utility in the diagnosis and prognosis. And this is because the correlation between ammonia and cirrhosis, uh, uh, ammonia and the severity of encephalopathy in cirrhotic patients is now known to be poor. It's compounded by the fact that the um, ammonia, whether you do it from the veins, whether you do it from the arteries, whether you get it properly iced, how well the lab deal with it, you get a very wide variety of, of 
um, of answers. And also the hyperammonemia can be um, increased by a whole load of things that our liver disease patients commonly find themselves um, exposed to. So really, testing for ammonia can be misleading in patients with cirrhosis and should be avoided. And I think of a patient that I saw in my practice, not in this country, but referred, should they be considered for transplantation, somebody with you know, something like child's pew B liver disease, some ascites on some diuretics, probably smoking and probably drinking. They were in Manchester. And they go into the uh, emergency room and somebody measures their ammonia. It's high. They come back to see me in clinic. They're perfectly compassmentous, no concerns, high-functioning job. Um, I get the referral. Do they need a transplant? They've got encephalopathy. Um, they don't have encephalopathy. It's an inappropriate test in that scenario. Entirely different is the situation of acute liver failure, where ammonia measurement is really important at predicting encephalopathy and mortality. And in fact, if you put together a high ammonia with a high MELD score, you've got a test that gives you a 98% risk of encephalopathy and also intracranial hypertension in these patients. So it's really important to know about that so you can institute therapy early, and I'll talk about that shortly. Um, and it, 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 reasonable sensitivity and specificity towards mortality as well. Now the differential diagnosis is wide and it depends on the setting that you find yourself in. Of course, course of coughs and withdrawal either from alcohol or drugs can make people be a little bit crazy and so you've got to differentiate that clinically. Really, really important to look for hypoglycemia in patients with acute liver failure who are presenting with even the most minor uh, neurological abnormality. I think many of us will have seen the tragic cases of people who've come forward, they've survived their transplant, but they wake up with irreversible brain damage due to previous hypoglycemia. A CT scan is not a reliable way to diagnose a cerebral hyperemia or intracerebral hypertension or encephalopathy, but it is important to do a CT to exclude things like bleeds. And again, in acute liver failure, particularly an EEG looking for non convulsive status can be helpful. Um, now, with regards to treatment, it's important if we go back to that holistic model of nomenclature that's now been proposed, that we always think of um, whether or not this condition has been precipitated and we try and uh, remove precipitating factors. And whilst most patients come to our, uh, who come to our door at the liver unit have uh, usually well done well on the bowel control, they're on lactulose, they're opening their bowels regularly, there's often things in there that just haven't been taken away. And they're commonly things like sleeping tablets and opiate analgesia, which really all need to be taken out it can be challenging in some patients, I agree. And of course, if you can treat the underlying liver disease by getting your alcoholics to stop drinking or more successfully use antiviral therapy for viral hepatitis. Um, now, lactulose remains the mainstay. I told you there wasn't going to be anything too new. Uh, lactulose remains the mainstay not only for bowel clearance but also for acidification of the gut. Um, which reduces the production of ammonia. And also antibiotics have been used for many years. We've had periods when we've been pro them, we've had periods when we've been against them, and we're currently in quite a strong period of been pro them because rifaximin has um, a, a very good efficacy but a very low um, profile of toxicity. And because of the many studies that have been done, it's now one of the most widely used antibiotics in encephalopathy. And these studies are big numbers. Perhaps the turning point was this one here, in which some nearly 300 patients, most of whom were already taking lactulose, were either treated with rifaximin or placebo. Um, and the improvement in, cephalop in encephalopathy in these patients was very dramatic. Um, more latterly, there's been another randomized control trial of large numbers showing that if you use lactulose with rifax rifaximin rather than placebo, you get less encephalopathy and you even get a lower mortality, and this has subsequently been shown in meta-analyses. So, as you know, it's funded here for people who've had lactulose and have failed it um, or have had lactulose don't tolerate it. Um, I'd implore you to consider rifaximin in your patients. It's a really good drug, as I'm sure most of you know. There's a whole load of other things that have been trialled, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, uh, Lola, I think some of us have had experience of here, and really not desperately helpful. Probiotics, branched-chain amino acids, and zinc have all been found lacking in the final analysis at actually doing any good for these patients. Now, all of that is around chronic liver disease. As I say, acute liver failure is entirely different, and standard management like lactulose and rifaximin has no place in the encephalopathy of acute liver failure. 
If somebody with acute liver failure has encephalopathy, they need a transplant, and that's the only thing that's going to rescue them. If you load their gut with... Um, if you load their gut with um, lactulose, you'll probably end up with a big blown gut that's going to get in the way of ventilation, so that should be avoided. And the treatment really in acute liver failure is directed not towards getting rid of the ammonia because the liver is too buggered to be able to make that useful. It's actually about reducing intracerebral hypertension and making the patients less likely to have um, cerebell cerebellar herniation. So early recourse to intubation and ventilation, quite simply to keep the patient quiet and the brain quiet. An early recourse to renal replacement therapy to reduce the risk of um, uh, too much volume in the brain. Literally nursing the patient at 45 degrees, not head up, but at 45 degrees, so you're using the basics of gravity to help with getting the fluid away from where you don't want it. And there's good evidence that keeping patients cool and keeping them hypertonic will reduce um, the risk of uh, cerebral complications of acute liver failure. And very much now we use hypertonic saline rather than mannitol because mannitol relies on people passing urine and most patients with acute liver failure don't do that. Cerebral pressure monitoring comes with lots of risks and um, we do it only infrequently even up at, uh, up at the Auckland Transplant Unit. I think it's always worth mentioning nutrition. Um, back, in, back in my younger days as a registrar, when I'd be giving these talks and would say a low-protein diet, there'd always be somebody in the audience that would stand, stand up and say, excuse me, my dear, I think you, need, I think you mean a low-protein diet, not a high-protein diet. But no, we mean a high-protein diet. Sarcopenia uh, predicts poor outcome in patients with cirrhosis, so it's important that they continue to be fed their high-protein, high-calorie diet so they don't develop malnutrition. And of course, it's important in all um, significant complications of liver disease that we think of transplantation. And as I've mentioned, the, the King's College criteria for acute liver failure of all types, paracetamol and non-paracetamol, are all lynched around grade 3, 4 encephalopathy. If possible, we would like to get your patients to us before they're intubated so we can at least have some sort of idea of the person that we're transplanting psychosocially. But we accept that it's not always possible, and particularly in the hyperacute group, it really is important important to consider intubation before you transport them because otherwise it can get very ugly in the back of an aeroplane. Um, again, indications for transplantation of chronic liver disease, different from acute liver disease, and you've got more time to think about it. And I think the way we've been talking about this, this the new nomenclature, we need to think about not only the severity of the encephalopathy, but whether there's any room to change precipitants or treat the underlying disease. But I think it's, it's a good um, academic exercise that if you see somebody who's encephalopathic for the first time, you ask yourself the question, are they a transplant candidate? If not, why not? What have I got to do to get them there if they're become somebody with recurrent encephalopathy. So I'd like to congratulate you all, actually all, everybody is still awake, um, and um, I hope that I've been able to share at least something or maybe refresh your memory about some things to do with encephalopathy, um, and mainly I hope I've got across the difference about acute and chronic uh, liver disease, and I hope you'll have a very pleasant evening. Thank you very much. Yeah, the, the, only, sorry, the, the only study that I know well is the one from Will Bernal, which was in 2007, and his were all within the first 24 hours. So it was the, it was the admission ammonia. Um, but I think we, we do them frequently and regularly. It's like too late, right? It looks like once it's 110, mm. it's Depends how severe their liver failure is. If you've got somebody in the first 24 hours who've got disease like that, they're the, they're the sort that fall into trouble. So, yeah, they're very high levels.
Oh, that's a good question. We certainly have no way of knowing when to take them off rifaximin. And most patients, I'm sure everybody has experience of, do really well on it. And they're actually quite reluctant to take themselves off it. But of course, people like alcoholics who stop drinking or whatever, they, they really can come off it. And it kind of becomes an adherence issue in the end. They sort of one day forget to take it. And, but I think, I think we all struggle with taking them off it, yeah. So a lot of these patients have inverted sleep patterns and it's difficult to, to know how to deal with mm. that. Is it part of, is it not beyond just the chronic liver impairment, is it part of the encephalopathy and, and how, do you, how do you manage that? Yeah, I think because it's... Uh, I recently had a patient of mine who was put on a benzo um, on, on a sleeper mm. uh, by a, another liver consultant came back to see me but it had some additional treatment mm. for their encephalopathy, so they had rifaximin added. But uh, I still really wasn't sure, and I thought that the benzo needed to stop. Mm. Yeah, I would have been with you. I mean, I can only tell you what my personal practice is, which is to explain to the patient what's happening. Um, if they've got um, sleep weight reversal, a lot of them aren't working, and I tell them to sleep when their body lets them sleep. I try and treat them with maximal therapy for their encephalopathy, and I would consider that benzos and opiates would actually make the situation worse rather than better. So, um, rightly or wrongly, that's what I do. Is there anybody who does any different? Thanks for the flicker test. Um, is it available actually on the net? Oh, is it? Um, yeah, so I was told right. that I, I haven't uh, looked it up myself, but yeah. uh, the UGW, um, I was certainly in a, in a presentation that said a lot of those things are available oh. on, on the web. And of course, there is uh, an indication with minimal uh, encephalopathy and survival. So, yep. there are, uh, so survival is worse yes. with even minimal encephalopathy. Mm. And quality of life, and of course, if you've got minimal encephalopathy, it predicts worsening enceph encephalopathy as well. But this this attitude of the psychological, I'd be, I'd be surprised if the true psychometric tests were available because they were absolutely staunch that they wouldn't let us use their tests for this study that we actually had funding from this organisation to do and had to give back. I'm serious. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I, di I didn't look into it in too much detail. <laughs> Questions. Thank you very much for a really. <laughs>
Hey, hey, one, two.